And we are anxious to hear if anybody has a prayer request or a praise report before, before I just lift a time of, of prayer to God. We do want to remember uh, the, the family of Estelle Myers. Estelle passed away this week after a long struggle with uh, Alzheimer's, and, uh, and so we want to re- remind ourselves to come alongside her family. The services will be on Saturday here at the church. And so anybody else have a prayer request or a praise report, something you want to, you know, oh, look, there's a, a man at this, a, 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 a handsome man in the balcony wants to say yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Others then. Okay. Well, it just, if you would just turn your attention to the Lord, just uh, set your heart upon him, be a Attendant on him. We've come here to be near his presence to see what his Holy Spirit is doing, what he's calling us to do. So let us be silent before him for a moment. And Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. We have so many blessings of family. We have found people who have gathered near and, and supported us and given us strength when, when we needed it. We've seen healing of body and, Lord, seen protection through danger. For all this, we give you thanks for what, is, what we have plenty of and, and what we can always share. Lord, we are thankful. We're thankful for this nation, and we're asking the Lord to, that you would come alongside it, both to strengthen it, defend it, to keep it free, to, to have your hand upon the hearts of all of our leaders so that they would go in the way you would have them to go. Lord, we are asking your compassion upon the, upon the sick, that uh, for, the, for the, the surgery to be had, for, for tests and, and, and answers from the doctor that are, that are to come this very week, the Lord just ask that, that you come alongside. Help us to live without fear, knowing that your hand is, is at work in all of this, that we are knowing that you are mighty to save and powerful to heal. Lord, would you be alongside families that, that mourn just now? And that you, have been, you would be faithful, Lord, to bless those that mourn, to be with them. And, Lord, to give them the, the comfort of your eternal hope, eternal life, salvation in Christ. Lord, just be there with answered prayer for them. Lord, we pray for parts of this world that do not know peace and the suffering of war and, and being uprooted from homes and uh, is, is heightened with cold temperatures coming on. And just ask, Lord, that your mercy be upon populations that are vulnerable, Lord, we, that you would be alongside our own military, and that you would keep them safe, Lord, keep them out of harm's way, and Lord, shorten the time that, that they might be deployed in, in dangerous areas. We ask for our community, for our neighbors, one and all, up and down the streets where we live, Lord, for those that are trying to make ends meet, those that are trying to, to find the solutions to, to keeping the household well and together and, and growing and strong. And just ask, Lord, for, for your hand to be with us, to, that you hear and answer our prayers. Lord, would you strengthen the churches in our community? Strengthen those, Lord, that also that are working to minister to human need. And, and ask, Lord, that they find your hand to be with them all times. Lord, we ask for the unspoken requests that we have, have among us. Lord, the things that you see in our hearts and only you know. And so, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Amen. Now it is, it is something to read from Mark chapter 2, uh, the calling of, of Levi, of Mr. Matthew. And so the story begins at verse 13. It says, And Jesus, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of, physici of a phys physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so, Lord, as a sinner whom you have called, standing amongst your people whom you have redeemed, we are thankful for your grace. Ask our Lord that our ears all be open to your call. And this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the setting of the story that, that we have Matthew at the tax booth and Jesus comes and, and calls him, says to him, follow me, the setting follows a healing story. It's, it's another one of the, you know, you're, you're in Mark, in reading in Mark and you get to chapter 2 and there he's teaching in the house and the house is so full that the people who are anxious to come along and uh, bring someone to Jesus so that he might heal them cannot get anywhere near and so they have a, four friends have a, a, a lame friend who, who cannot move, he's a paralytic and they bundle him up in a, in, a, in a blanket and haul him to the roof and they pull the tiles from the roof away and lower him down so that Jesus might might heal him, and it is a scene that, that just, you know, sets, sets out who Jesus is. He is the Messiah bringing power. He is the Messiah bringing forgiveness of sins and healing and life. And so Jesus goes forth from there, and the crowds are following him. And he's teaching by the sea. It's, it's, that, it's that whole picture of the ministry of Christ. Now, we know something about when we're reading this story that, that the the people don't, because we, we kind of, our eye can stray down, you know, to the next thing, oh, Jesus calls Levi, he calls, he calls Mr. Matthew to be a disciple, so we know, we know what is coming next, and we know that there's a different sort of miracle that happens that perhaps is not the miracle that people were expecting, because if, if you've had a, a noted paralytic and brought by his friends and lowered down through the ceiling, you know that healing power from Christ is here to, to make the body well, and, and people are no doubt saying, well, shall it be a blind man next or a deaf man or, or someone with a, a crippling illness? What, what shall it be? And Jesus is going along, and we know what's happening next. He is going to heal a person who is laid low, made sick, his life ruined by sin. He's going to heal a sin-sick soul. Now, this is not supposed, really, I think, what, what the group that is following Jesus is all about to hear. And so, Matthew takes us to show us just how this turns out. He says he finds Levi, the son of Alphaeus, at the tax booth. Now, we, we have to, we, we will talk about this as, as we, we give our good Bible instruction and say, well, um, we got nothing to say against people that collect taxes now. They're lovely people, great, have many admirable qualities. I've known people who cash the checks for the municipality, the tax check. There's nothing wrong with those people. But back in the day... Any Jew who was collaborating with the Romans to, to collect the taxes was, was considered quite the turncoat. He was no doubt lining his pockets with lots of extra money that he collected. And so we have, you know, everyday life and Bible time, some teaching. But you don't even have to get that far into what we would call historical research. Because you can read the story, and as soon as Jesus is at Matthew's house, they say, he's with a tax collector. And that's supposed to mean something. 
That's, that's supposed to say all you need to say. Now consider then that Matthew, who is the Levi in the story, uh, Ma- Matthew made sure this story was in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, original with him. This is how I got to know Jesus. And consider that Matthew made sure that everybody knew what he was doing when the Christ came by. And it wasn't something that anybody would boast about. It wasn't anything anybody admired. As, as you can see from the reaction that people said, he's a tax collector. We, we have to get somewhere beyond just the idea of a tax collector. Someone who is doing something very, very wrong and that nobody but nobody is going to vote and say, I think they're really quite nice people and we should, we should, we should tolerate and, uh, and love that. Um, Matthew, the purveyor of pornography, might really be pretty close. Someone who is violating our social norms, someone who is capitalizing on the vulnerabilities of people around, someone who is taking away the foundations of how we learn to live decently with one another, and he's making a huge profit out of it, this is Matthew. And consider that Matthew says, you know, as a Jew, I'd always heard that Messiah would come. I'd always heard that Messiah would come, and one day he would set his feet upon the temple. And what was I doing when the Messiah came? Everything wrong. I was found out. I had, it's going to be down 2,000 years of gospel history. People reading about Matthew was caught doing the bad thing. And he says, go ahead and say so. Because we are looking at the miracle of Jesus healing a sin-sick soul. We have seen him to heal the body. Can he heal the sinner? Now, how does he heal the sinner? So we're looking at the picture here, and, and uh, you can find it to, to look at, this Carvaggio's The Call of Levi. I'm, I'm a fan of, of, of good art. I'm not a fan of non-representational art, which is art that doesn't look like anything. I like art that represents things. So this art is representing Jesus coming through the door. He's, he's there, well, the one with his hand out, and there are five people at the tax collector booth. Now, a piece of art like this teaches a theological lesson, a a gospel lesson, by giving us the picture because we're seeing five people, two old, uh, two rather young, and there's a dog in the picture. If you get it on Wikimedia, you can see it. Uh, But the dog comes not into the story. But three young, two old, and you say to yourself, which one is Matthew? Matthew. Is he the one looking down, not paying any attention, and this is going to be the moment that he wakes up? Is he one of the ones looking at Jesus? Is he one of the old people who has been 30, 40, 50 years maybe in this lifestyle of exploiting his neighbors and piling up wealth for himself and spreading misery all around? Is he one of the ones paying attention, or is he one of the ones paying no attention? Is Jesus calling which one? Is not Jesus likely calling all of them if it was a picture of the scene? Well, which one will be Matthew? Well, then you can begin to say, as we're asking all these very interesting questions about Caravaggio's painting, well, isn't the lesson a great deal is going to depend on his response? Your choices matter. That is a lesson being taught. God gives you the dignity that he will offer his invitation. He will say, follow me. And the eternal consequences weigh upon whether you're going to answer, yes, I will follow you. Whether you are Matthew, who gets up from the tax table and follows Jesus. There is everything else going on. There's everything to keep him there. There's his whole life, either the career that he's building. I want to be like those hated old men with the beards. I want to be him someday. Or I am one of these men with a beard that everybody despises, and I've done this all my life. Can you walk away from that? Can you just simply respond? How does Jesus heal the sinner? He tells that sinner, follow me. What is the power behind that? The power of your choice. 
It is now in your court. It is God has given his invitation. He's saying, well, what will you do? It's not a question of which one of those five is Matthew. What will you do if you are one of those people that Jesus catches out, says, here is your problem of sin, here's your life that you need to leave, will you, will you follow me? Now, in the following, he becomes, in the story, an entirely different person because he is named Levi, son of Alphaeus. He has kind of a religious name. It's kind of like naming your kid John Wesley if you're a Methodist or Martin Luther if you're a Lutheran or something like that. He's Levi. That's the, that's the tribe of the religious, especially religious Jews. The temple servants. He's the son of somebody that was known. And Levi does not appear the name after this spot. We get down into, into chapter 3. By, by verse 13, Jesus is choosing the 12 apostles. And Levi, as a name, has dropped out. And he's known as Matthew. It would be thought shifty if I would change my name. But Matthew was quite ready to say what has happened in my life. When I stood up from the tax table and followed Jesus, there was not only the past that I had ruined and the life that I had lived, there's the entirely new thing that's going on in my life. What you can r say with, with realistic truth is that it is not I who lives anymore, but it is Jesus who lives within me. Jesus does, finds us this way, and his call is for us to respond with our hearts and be healed. Now, can he do that? You see, the great plan of Satan, I really think, was that if there was any rescue operation begun by God for humanity, men and women, fallen and broken as they are, that they would be so ruined, so lost, that the Lord, when he arrived, would finally trash and broken remains of people. Nothing worth saving. And it seems to be true in Matthew's case. In fact, it is true in my case. What worthy thing worth saving is there? We, we consider, you know, and the... And the world has always known that there's, this problem exists. There was, there was the Greek philosopher Diogenes, the one that lit a lamp in the daytime, and he carried it through the streets looking for an honest man. And he was a clever philosopher and a great talker, and if you said, me, I'm an honest man, by the time he talked with you five minutes, he'd say, no, you're not an honest man. Everyone had falsehood and lies in their life. It's, it's, it's kind of like going through society now with their lighted lamp looking for a company that gives good customer service. You can't find it. It's really hard. Now, Diogenes never thought, though he found no honest man, he never thought to look inside a thief. But Jesus did. There is a thief on the cross beside him, on that day on Calvary when Jesus died and that thief said an honest thing. He said, we are getting what we deserve and he has done nothing wrong. Jesus looked inside the thief and found an honest man. He came into the heart of the thief and offered him paradise. Just as Jesus will go into people who are greedy and grasping and make them generous, people who are overcome with lust and are driven by all their passions and will make them pure, people who are heedless and selfish and turn them into saints. He does not do this because he finds us well any more than a doctor makes appointments with people who aren't sick. He finds us sick. And by the touch of his hand, we are made alive. Matthew is made new just simply by responding to Jesus' call. And the truth is then, 
It is not Levi, the tax collector, that lives anymore, but Christ lives within him so that it is safe enough to say, Levi's gone. Matthew is here. Our choices actually matter. And so it kind of solves that other puzzle. Because, you know, in the, in the Gospels, we're familiar also with the call of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishermen by the sea, and Jesus comes up to them as they're cleaning their nets, and he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so we can see even through the Gospels, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are, are, uh, are close in Jesus' circle, and, he, and they're nearby him at the, at the key moments of his ministry. They have things to say, and the book of Acts opens with Peter and John also going forth, and they're doing just that. They're fishing for men. They're evangelizing, and we're saying, but there's all this fuss about calling Matthew, and what does he do? What was... What was the change in their soul? What if we saw the fisher, the fisher guy of fish becoming a fisher of men? What, what changes Matthew the tax collector? And Matthew the tax collector, well, we do know. His name is attached to a gospel. We find out something about his soul, that his soul is so taken up, he is so captivated with seeing Christ, with being near his presence, he is caught up in his word and lives to tell the story of Jesus and to relate his words. He is a man changed by the word of God. Your choices matter. You respond to God, you get in, you can know his word, you can be in his presence, and your life can change which then just raises the other question that people would have had in Jesus' day is that might be what Jesus can do, but should Jesus do that? You realize there might have been a lot of people saying, yes, we're walking with the Messiah. Yes, we're going to go, the Messiah is going by the tax collector's booth. Yes, the Messiah is noticing the tax collector. Let's see the Messiah work some justice on that tax collector. Let's see that uh, that tax collector squirm. Not should that, not can that sinner be healed, but should that sinner be healed. You see in that picture, you know, there's a disciple behind Jesus, and you can make up your own mind whether, I don't think he looks incredibly happy. He's not running around pushing the tax collectors forward and saying, hey, you need to meet Jesus. You know, you're a real waste of human life. You need to know Jesus. They're not doing that. He might even be one who is just, if Jesus is going to go in there, I guess I'll stick my, my head in. People were not hounding notable sinners to find Christ. They were bringing paralytics. They were saying, here we have a blind man. They were not saying, sinners, we got to get sinners up to Jesus. We, we don't. We have trouble doing that now. We have trouble enough getting people who are physically ill to get healing. I'm fine. I don't need to go to the doctor. I was having a heart attack, and I'm saying, I can walk this off. Yeah. And I could fill a bus with children who say something along the lines of, Mom won't do her therapy, even though the doctor said she should. Let alone getting people to Jesus. We don't, we don't round up people and say, you have such a sour attitude, you need to go find Jesus. Come to church with me. That'll suit, that'll fix that. We don't. Perhaps we should. That difficult uncle at the Christmas table. You know, but Jesus makes it easier because his invitation to the sinner is that simple and that direct, follow me. Matthew, we would say, Matthew has issues. He should follow me. Do you know what he's do? He should follow me. Do you realize he doesn't know anything about, he should follow me. He has habits like, he should follow me. It is in the response. It is given to him to respond to the call of Christ, and it is us to pray for that he have the grace to respond. And there were people who would not be sure. 
Matthew is getting, given, get a, given his second chance or his third chance or fourth. Was Max, Matthew the tax collector, Levi the tax collector, giving people a lot of second chances? Hmm? Probably not. And that is why the Pharisees, in the follow-up, ask their question. They do, you know, they're trying to drive a wedge between Jesus and the disciples because they go and ask the disciples, hey, let's get you over here. I know, I know Jesus is interesting and he talks well. Come over here, we want to ask you a question. They don't want to ask Jesus, hey, why do you eat with sinners? Because the simple answer is you eat with sinners or you eat alone, as simple as that. But why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? Again, with that idea, tax collectors. Oh. Well, thinking about that, that's a hypocritical question. It is the Pharisees, lovers of the word of God, people who are excited about the law, people who had rules about how you kept the Sabbath and how you kept a house clean of contamination from unholy things, they would be the first ones to stand on the street corner with a written prayer and saying, Oh, Lord, we suffer so because Israel will not keep Torah. Israel will not keep their Sabbaths if only they would. Well, now one sinner is paying close attention to a rabbi. The great rabbi has the full attention of a room full of sinners, and the Pharisees are unhappy because there is a game the righteous play that the Messiah might come, and what will definitely happen is I will look a lot better than some other people. Jesus might come and return at any moment, and I won't be as bad as some folks. God might bring his judgment down and call us all to account, but just look around this world. I, I, I'm way better. I have competed, and I have at least come in second, third, fourth, or fifth. I'm not last. But the rabbi has the full attention of the sinner, and he does not want to work justice, but he wants to bring mercy. There is the choice of the tax collector to follow is also the choice of God to show mercy. He does not give Levi Matthew what he deserves. He gives him what he absolutely does not deserve. And he plans to do that with all of us. He plans to give us all that call, follow me. He knows about your issues. He knows about what you're hiding. He knows about what you, what you just, just have never been able to defeat in your life. He knows what is the deepest confession in your heart. And he says, mercy waits at this point for you. This is the Lord that we praise. He wants me to die altogether to who I am and the competition I'm having with the rest of you so that I might appear a little better at the judgment. He wants me to leave all that behind and set my attention fully and entirely upon him. So, Father, we ask that, that there be no more game to be played here. You have called the sinner to repentance. You have called us to know your love and to follow you. If you want to just say to God with your hand to be raised, to say, Lord, Lord, today I will follow. Lord, you know what you have called me away from. You know that you have what, you're, what, what the new life for me might look like, and I will let you have full control. Lord, let it be true in my heart that it is not me that is living anymore, but you are living within me. Be the source of the new story that is written from this moment. And Lord, teach me who I can bring to you. The altar is open as we pray, as we sing. You may come, but let, Lord, let the Lord bless and keep the decisions made today. Amen.